The river you see here was once teeming with wild Atlantic salmon. Before the 1800s, Salmon River of Pulaski, New York, had such an abundance of salmon that locals would use pitchforks to spear and toss the fish out of the water. Atlantic salmon are androgynous fish migrating from the sea to spawn in fresh water lakes and rivers. Every fall, salmon crowded this river and laid their eggs. While most died, some fish can recover and travel back out to sea and repeat this cycle numerous times, in contrast with Pacific salmon that dies soon after spawning. Rivers such as these serve as nurseries, and in about one to two years, the fry will migrate back to the ocean and grow to the reproductive maturity. In the 1800s, populations in the Salmon River began a steep decline in tributaries such as Little Sandy Creek, Trout Brook, and Orwell Brook due to a number of anthropogenic factors. Water pollution, habitat degradation, and overexploitation, construction of dams along the river and its tributaries all contributed to the downfall of the wild Atlantic salmon. Previously overlooked anthropogenic factors such as the effects of artificial light pollution are beginning to be examined for potential effects that it may have on salmon populations. Hatchery reared fry that were raised in incubators exposed to artificial light dispersed from the incubators on average of 2.8 days later than those reared without being exposed to artificial light, which an analyst of variance determined artificial light to have a statistically significant impact upon Atlantic salmon fry behavior. The same story can be told for most of the northeastern U.S., where the full historic range of wild Atlantic salmon has drastically been reduced. Studies conducted off the coast of Nova Scotia showed that at sea mortality rates of Atlantic salmon have remained above 95%, even after all commercial fishing in the waters were prohibited. This data indicates that environmental variation may play a similarly significant role in affecting population abundance of Atlantic salmon. The wild Atlantic salmon populations of northeastern North America migrated to the major river basins of Greenland and the Ungava River drainage of Quebec, extending southward along the eastern United States from the Saco, Penobscot, and Androscoggin rivers of Maine to the Connecticut River and Merrimack River of Massachusetts. Although wild salmon population abundance of the past four centuries is unknown, we do know that in 1960 to the early 70s, a high salmon abundance was noted and about 12,000 tons were caught commercially within their home rivers in 1973. In the past two decades, these populations are now only stable in northern Canada and Greenland, while most of the populations of the eastern United States and southern Canada are extirpated or declining. Historically, Lake Ontario held the largest freshwater population of Atlantic salmon in the world, yet by the 1900s, Atlantic salmon had been eliminated from the Lake Ontario watershed. One method that the International Union for the Conservation of Nature uses to categorize the endangerment of a species is by analyzing the species' abundance with various factors such as survivorship, mortality rates, and environmental factors that predict the likelihood of the species to persist into the future. This method is referred to as a population viability analysis. Factors to be considered in a population viability analysis for Atlantic salmon populations include, but are not limited to, environmental factors, kelting, and hatchery supplementation. A population viability analysis of Atlantic salmon populations in Maine determined that a 50% increase in juvenile survival would be required to result in a replacement of one for individuals of all cl age classes for that year. If a juvenile survival remained constant, marine survival would have to be increased from 0 0.04 to 0 0.10 to produce a replacement rate of 1 in the population. Population viability analyses are merely a tool to simulate how potential factors affect a population, but it can provide insight to factors that, when altered, will produce the most extreme outcomes. Knowing what factors influence populations allows conservation efforts to be focused on aspects of Atlantic salmon population dynamics that will have the greatest impacts. Humans have utilized many different hatcheries techniques over the past 140 years to conserve for Atlantic salmon, among other fish species. 
These hatcheries were created in the mindset that nature could not sustain itself under the pressure of our society's needs and the habitat destruction that accompanies the presence of humans. A comparison of the number of alleles, allelic richness, and inbreeding coefficient showed significant decreases in the genetic diversity of hatchery-reared Atlantic salmon. Hatchery-reared Atlantic salmon reported to survive approximately 68% more than semi-wild salmon. From 2003 to 2012, hatcheries in the Atlantic U.S. and Canada released approximately 15 million Atlantic salmon annually. A generalized process of the hatchery begins with the live spawning of Atlantic salmon in natural channels where the eggs are stripped and incubated in egg baskets or deep troughs. Those that hatch are called elvins and are kept in the incubation system until the fry swim up in search of food. The fry that swim to the top are either released into nature or kept and fed to allow further growth before being released. Broad research has been conducted on the optimal size, maturity, and areas of release that reach the highest yields from conservation efforts. Many vaccines, diagnostic techniques, and various medicines have been developed since the beginnings of hatcheries, which have been beneficial in conserving for Atlantic salmon. New York State fishing regulations allow the fishing of landlocked salmon from April 1st through October 15th with a daily limit of three fish taken, but any fish caught under 15 inches must be released and it is illegal to take salmon near Maine or coastal districts. Commercial fishing of Atlantic salmon has been outlawed since 1948. In 1982, the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Act was passed to help restore population levels. This act required the president to assign three commissioners to advise the Secretary of State to receive reports, requests, and accommodations and proposals from the North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organization. This bill also made it illegal to fish for Atlantic salmon in certain Atlantic waters, punishable by civil and criminal penalties. This helped reduce the number of salmon that are removed from the oceanic waters. The Bay of Maine is also protected from fishing through the Endangered Species Act. One of the recommendations that came out of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Act was dam mitigation. Dam mitigation works by either eliminating dams or cutting holes into them to allow fish to travel between dams. Supporters of Atlantic salmon in the Northeast are currently trying to enact dam mitigation that would help keep salmon from being landlocked and bring historic population levels back. It would also improve fish passage for fish that are not landlocked and is currently being enacted in Maine to restore population numbers of non-landlocked salmon. Funding for such projects can be received by NOAA through a sponsored Trout Unlimited. Contributions are usually between 10 and 100,000 US dollars. NOAA also has more sponsors that can provide dam mitigation regardless of species, such as the Open Rivers Initiative, which can be from 50,000 to $250,000. A dam mitigation assessment on the Susquehanna River found that only 9 of the 92 dams they looked at could use mitigation. This cut the projected cost by 90% from $15.7 million to $1.4 million. Anthropogenic changes to the environment, such as algal blooms, that deplete areas of water from oxygen, have caused losses up to $16 million in the Canadian aquaculture industry. In Ireland, Atlantic salmon alone attribute nearly 72 million euros to the aquaculture industry. Climate change, water eutrophication, habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, and many other factors lead to declines in Atlantic salmon populations as well as drastic economic declines as well. The majority of factors contributing to Atlantic salmon declines are a result of some sort of human activity, yet the causes of these problems are so embedded into our society that drastic societal changes would have to be made if conservation efforts are to be met. Every year, farm salmon escape from their nets and enclosures and enter streams with the wild salmon populations when they reach maturity. The ever-increasing amount of aquaculture has raised concern for the effects that farm salmon escaping from hatcheries will have on wild populations. 
In certain waterways of Norway, farmed salmon have been recorded to constitute an average of 14 to 36 percent of the local population, with some streams having escaped salmon accounting for up to 80 percent of the population. The escape farm salmon can lead to the transmission of sea lice and other diseases that wild salmon are not commonly exposed to. The integration of farm salmon also leads to shifts in the genetic composition of wild salmon populations, which can cause depressions in overall fitness, productivity, and ability to adapt to environmental changes. The stocking of Atlantic salmon is significantly related to the amount of rainbow trout present in Lake Ontario and its tributaries. The rainbow trout population estimates were significantly lower when there were high rates of Atlantic salmon stocking as opposed to when there were no Atlantic salmon stocking in Lake Ontario. Rainbow trout have also been observed to be significantly shorter in length in relation to the high Atlantic sa salmon rearing rate. Rainbow trout have also been observed to be significantly shorter in length in relation to high Atlantic salmon rearing rates, where average length was approximately 49 millimeters as opposed to an average length of 54 millimeters when Atlantic salmon were not present. The global decline in wild Atlantic salmon populations is a complicated management concern with multiple anthropogenic factors contributing to their demise. We can, however, single out major causes of decline, such as the construction of dams along historic salmon runs, pollution of waterways, and the reduction of fitness in populations due to interbreeding of escaped farmed salmon. It is a struggle to find the best management approach to conserve wild salmon. Even though efforts are being made to restore North American populations, they continue to decline. It is imperative that rigorous research and adaptive management is applied to declining salmon populations in order to conserve this iconic fish species and return these populations to their historic abundances.